Hi everyone, welcome to today's GA seminar. I'm Tanya Whiteway, I'm the Chief Scientific Information Officer at GA and I am chairing the seminar today. I'd like to start first by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land in which we're meeting. Um, for us, it's the Ngunnawal people, but I'm sure there's lots of people on different lands today. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and any other First Nations people who are participating in our seminar today. Welcome. Uh, our speaker this week is David Hazelhurst, and this is a return by popular demand to recap and expand on his talk from September the 2nd this year on the benefits of an agile mindset in the workplace. And I think since we spoke to you last, David, you might have had a change of um, location and workplace. Uh, David is the DEPSEC of Agricultural Trade Group in the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment. In this role, he supports farmers, food processors and exporters to sustainably grow their businesses through access to overseas markets and regulatory services to meet the requirements of trading partners. Prior to this, he was the Deputy CEO of Business Partnerships and supported Austrade, responsible for strategy and business transformations, partnerships, digital and IT, and corporate and ministerial services. And previously, David held senior appointments in four other portfolios. He has led teams advising prime ministers on economic and industry policy, federal budgets, and the Council of Australian Governments. He also drove initial implementation of the Australian Government's Digital Transformation Agenda and was appointed Interim CEO of the Digital Transformation Office. Now, um, David is going to uh, do a slightly different arrangement today. My understanding is that you're going to give us a short recap on the uh, presentation you gave previously, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A um, and try and get some more conversation happening um, and some more questions answered, because I still have four questions that were unanswered from the previous one, which I also want to pose to you. So um, without further ado, welcome, David. We're looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thanks very much, Tanya, and hello, everybody. Um, uh, hope you're having a wonderful day. Um, yes, I'm delighted to be back. Um, and as, um, as Tanya suggested, I thought I would uh, do a very brief recap, but really open up um, uh, for more conversation and questions. Um, uh, I must confess, I haven't gone back and reviewed the video. So if I say some things that I've said previously, I apologise, um, but I've only got about six stories, so it's quite likely you'll hear at least one or two of them again. Um, uh, but you'll recall from last time, um, those of you that um, uh, were tuned in on that occasion, um, that uh, I talked a bit about um, my own journey um, from being a, a serious... Um, highbrow policy wonk uh, across various parts of Canberra, uh, having the experience of then um, engaging in learning about um, agile methodologies and human-centred design when I worked on the setup of the Digital Transformation Office and having a fairly profound kind of road to Damascus conversion, um, that there were lots of things about those approaches uh, to work, um, both in terms of the kind of approach to project management and governance and um, ways of working, but also in terms of particularly the human-centred design aspects and user research uh, and user centricity that I thought were not just relevant to digital, but in fact were relevant to almost everything to do with public policy and administration. Um, and that, that had thereafter made me very painful for all of the people that I worked with because I'd become a bit of a zealot about some of those things. Uh, although I think I said last time I try to be a zealot with a sense of humour. Um, and so recognise that actually it's one thing to have a whole set of methodologies or processes or different ways of doing things, but actually the hardest thing is not the processes, it's culture. Uh, and that if you come into 
uh, working in with different ways of doing things or trying to encourage a different approach without having regard to um, taking a human-centred design approach <laughs> to adopting new ways of working and being mindful of culture and winning hearts and minds. Um, if you don't do those things, it will almost certainly fail. Um, so you'll recall from last time I talked a fair bit about some of the basic principles of agile and human-centred design and their broader applicability, Thing, things like um, the, the cadence of working in, um, in sprints towards minimum viable products rather than trying to boil the ocean and deliver the whole thing in one go, um, whatever the thing is. Delivering value early, delivering it often, testing it with the people who it's designed for uh, early and often. So in digital speak, that would be the users, but it could be anyone affected by your policy or your program or your scientific endeavour. Uh, that, that has also aspects that are to do with stripping out of uh, too much paperwork and hierarchy uh, and having a preference for um, seeing the thing rather than reporting on the thing. So showing the thing to um, both users but also, frankly, to colleagues and senior people up the line, um, having a showcase of what you've been working on rather than a report, a written report. Um, and having a very strong sense of empowerment of teams to um, be given the freedom to actually make sure that you've got the right problem around defining the problem, uh, as well as uh, trusting the process to allow uh, solutions to, those, to that problem to emerge rather than necessarily thinking, A, that you'll know really what the problem is up front and B, that you'll necessarily know what the solution is up front uh, and that that can be quite challenging to hierarchical organisations where it's quite common for the person at the top of the organisation or people in senior positions, including, of course, ministers and or ministerial staff to say, we already know what the problem is. And not only that, we know what the solution is. Just get on with doing that. Uh, so it can be quite challenging to that. In the time that since we last met, we've been doing quite a bit of work with my teams here, thinking about how we'll um, introduce uh, and roll out new ways of working. Um, and I say new ways of working because if you just say agile, you're sort of starting with a with a word that kind of immediately gets people going, Jesus, what are you talking about? Um, and uh, we've been doing um, some initial training of people, um, but very focused on them bringing their project with them, not getting training done in isolation, but getting training done in the context of, here's my project, it's in my business plan, it's a real thing, I have to deliver it. Let's use that as a way of thinking about how might I do things differently. Uh, and trying to do that training in teams as well so that it's not just one person who then has to try and sell it to the rest of the team, but the whole team gets um, immersed in it. Quite a bit of focus on training of senior management. So we had a half day with my uh, band twos and band ones where we had some training and then we workshopped how we would make this work and what, what people felt comfortable with, uncomfortable with, um, particularly some of these issues to do with um, less reporting, uh, more doing. Um, one nice way one of the consultants referred to it is you want to have more people on the field and less people keeping score. Uh, and I thought that was quite a neat way of thinking about it. Um, and um, we also talked quite a bit um, about... Um, Potentially the language being a barrier uh, of, you know, sprints, retrospectives, backlogs, um, stand-ups, um, minimum viable products, etc. And we agreed that what we needed was a minimum viable vocabulary um, because actually there are some concepts that, it's, that are different from um, what people are familiar with that it's really important that there's a small number of them, but everyone understands what they are and they use the language the same way. And if it is a new thing, it's okay to have a new word. Um, 
but not to have too much. So for example, the consultants came in and started talking to people about needing to have right sized t-shirts. Uh, and I, I'd never heard of that before. Um, and I said, we're not having any t-shirts. Um, they can talk about right sizing things that they're going to have taken from their backlog, put into the things they're going to do in that sprint. But that's about sizing the, the chunks of work. It doesn't need to be called a t-shirt. Uh, so I'm just reflecting, I suppose, in this, these introductory comments on some of the things that we're that we're working through and wrestling with just at the moment and thinking about the cultural change. Um, and what I would also say then about that is um, uh, it's been good to spend quite a bit of time with the leadership team on it and to see them uh, coming to grips with it, coming to grips with the idea that it's there's some value in it. Uh, and it's also been interesting. We've got about two or three teams now who are a fair way into the process. They've had about four sprints uh, and interesting for them now to be able to share their experience of that journey so that initially they found it quite uncomfortable. They didn't like it very much at all. They felt like it was something that was being done to them. Um, but at two or three sprints in, they're now saying actually they get it. They can see how it's valuable. Um, they're, they're enjoying it as being a, a not just, pardon me, different, but better uh, way of working. Uh, and it's becoming quite fun uh, and they're, become, they're feeling a sense of empowerment and competence around using it because it's not that difficult. These concepts are not rocket science, but the key thing is they are different. They're not, the just, um, they're not just about saying we'll work faster or we're very nimble here. You know, we know how to jump around and do different things and form teams quickly and yada, yada, yada. That's not the same thing as Agile. There's some overlap, um, but Agile, I always say to people, Agile, uh, when used around here, should be the noun, not the adjective. If people are using it as the adjective, they're to stop uh, because it's confusing. It's the noun, as in it's a set of things. It's a methodology. It's a set of principles. It's not just descriptive of being quick or nimble or whatever. So the journey continues for us. Um, and what I can see is that, of course, culture change is the hardest thing. Um, and so um, it's very easy to say, here's the new playbook, here are the, here are the prescriptions for the processes and for it not to work. And, and equally, for people to try it, hate it, never to want to do it again. Uh, so it is very much about um, sticking with it. It is about culture. It is the, the leaders have to walk the walk as well as talking the talk. Um, and in some ways, that's the hardest part. So some of the biggest concerns you often hear are that, well, we're on board for this, but our, our leaders think it's a joke um, and they don't want to do it. Well, they say they do, but they don't really because they don't behave the way that they need to, which is different. So I might pause there. Tanya, because I think I've spoken for about 10 minutes. Um, and hopefully that's been enough of a recap for people to remember what I've said. And if you weren't there last time, uh, I can't help you. Um, but I'll almost certainly cover a lot of things that I said last time and then hopefully be able to expand on them a bit um, in the discussion that we now have. Thank you. Thanks for the intro. Um, we do have some questions left over from last time, which I would like to go back to because some of them I think are really important. Um, and they actually go to a bit of a conversation that you didn't introduce um, as much in your prep this time. And that was around um, how can we do it um, better in government in general? So the question that I've got in mind here is, um, thanks for sharing your thoughts on Agile, David. Do you think NPPs could be pitched with this flexibility and scalability in mind? Uh, we could see more MPPs going forward rather than the select few set pieces. Um, I guess they mean by that you could have more MPPs focused on MVPs and then see whether they succeed or fail and then have checkpoints where you could then progress further and reinvest in those. I think that's what they're getting at. Mm, that's a really interesting idea. Um, so I'd say two things about that. Um, the first is that... Uh, some of the work around doing that, the early work of discovery and 
uh, development of initial prototypes to test things with users is cheap. You don't need an MPP. You actually just need some different skill sets. Um, but it's about adding to the skill sets that you have around policy development, this kind of thinking um, and, and user research. Uh, so being able to go out and really deeply understand uh, why people behave the way they do um, by engaging with them uh, in their place, observing what they do. Um, and uh, so the first part to the answer to the question is, I think you can do that without needing to actually have an NPP. And it helps you then to actually frame up your policy proposal because what you're basing it then on is a combination of um, empirical analysis, um, policy logic, uh, and this um, uh, design-led, design thinking approach uh, to really being clear about what the problem is and really being clear what, about what potential solutions can be. Um, and that it's not expensive to do that. Um, and it should be something that we do in the same way as we do empirical analysis. Um, it should be part of our toolkit, I think. The second thing I would say is that I think it is very often the case that having said, broadly speaking, this is what we're intending to do, that there's still the opportunity in the detailed policy design that will, and program design that will often follow as part of implementation of a policy uh, decision uh, and a decision around a budget proposal is to also build into that human-centred design uh, and agile ways of working uh, and um, build into that then as the program or the policy or the um, even the service, if it's a digital service, for example, or just the service delivery model, build into that early and often testing with users uh, so that as you're rolling out implementation, um, uh, you're still remaining humble and open to different ways of precisely how the thing will work. Um, it is a bit tricky because, of course, when you're costing an NPP, you have to provide detail you know, and cost things within an inch of their lives in order to get it through a, an agreed costing process with the Department of Finance. But to be honest, my view is if having got the NPP up, you then uh, approach implementation with a view to saying, well, we know broadly what the outcome is that we're trying to achieve here, but we're going to have uh, a process now of rapid policy, further policy refinement, program design, if you like, um, or service design. And you then come back to government and say, actually, to achieve this outcome, we're going to make the, a little bit of a tweak here. We're going to do it this way rather than that way. By and large, ministers will go, that's fine, crack on. Um, occasionally they won't. They'll be very attached to a particular way of doing things. Occasionally that'll be a ministerial advisor. But um, by and large, ministers just want to get to the right outcome and they, want, um, they don't want to do something that's not going to work. So um, I think you can build it in upfront before the NPP uh, and it should be part of just business as usual about how you do policy and program thinking. And then, as I say, I think there's scope once you've got the NPP up to be able to, um, uh, to, be able to um, continue through the implementation process uh, to take that kind of agile and human-centred design approach. What I don't think the government is ready for yet uh, is to say, bring out all your ideas, uh, which is the sort of tail end of the original question, um, and we'll fund them all $250,000 each and we'll see whether which ones are going to fly. I think that's something more that departments should be doing themselves. I don't think you, at, at now, I don't think the government's, government is ready for that kind of approach to be funded centrally through the budget. And frankly, I think a lot of ministers would say, isn't that what the department should be doing anyway? Um, doing that initial thinking and work and complementing the kinds of approaches to policy development that, they, that are traditional with um, bringing in some of these other ones. Hmm. I'm wondering about the incubator approach where you might be able to join private and public partnerships um, together to incubate small 
options and maybe some funding from organisations to to do that to get things started as opposed to the big bang yep. MPPs. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question is: um, Hi, David. I would be interested um, to hear your approach to showing people what they can't see in inverted commas, so maybe that might be something that you said in your last presentation, uh, when it comes to HCD and an agile way of working. What have been your strategies to overcome some of the challenges when trying to implement these with people who are not used to it? And I think you started a little bit to delve into that with your teams who are feeling the pressure, but maybe a bit of expansion on that would be great, thanks. Sure. Uh, so it's, it's quite hard um, and uh, and what I've often said to people is you don't really get it until you do it. Uh, so it, it is actually a bit of an experiential thing um, and it's a little bit why I sometimes refer to myself as having a road to Damascus conversion um, because it's something you actually experience and once, once that light bulb goes off, you sort of never be the same again. Um, but there is quite a lot of quite accessible, uh, there's also quite a lot of accessible kind of literature in inverted commas, things like um, uh, podcasts and TED Talks and um, uh, uh, YouTube videos and um, whatnot that will give people a sense of how it's different. Um, and oftentimes it's useful to bring in, you can get a good speaker to come in and talk about how it's different. And uh, uh, there, there's, the, you know, for those that really like reading something that has some serious academic kind of credentials to it, you can start with something like, I can't remember whether I mentioned this last time, but there's quite a neat um, Harvard Business Review article called um, an economist, no, not an economist, an anthropologist walks into a bar Dot, dot, dot. Um, and and forgive me if I mentioned this last time, but it's quite a neat little article. It's about ten pages, and it it talks about a, a a brewing company that's doing very well in supermarkets and terrible in bars, and they couldn't work out why. Um, and they'd done all their market research of a traditional nature, lots of focus groups and um, um, surveys and things like that. Couldn't work out. Why, why it wasn't working in bars. And in the end, out of desperation, they sent in a little squad of um, anthropologists uh, to go and sit in the back of the bars quietly having a little drink and just watching what was going on and then talking to both patrons and staff about um, what was happening and why. Um, I won't spoil the whole story, but um, it was a good example of... Uh, having faith in something that wasn't just empirical, that was more um, about observation uh, and really understanding what was going on in people's heads uh, and the actual behavioural things that were going on. So what am, why am I stressing this? Well, in terms of helping people um, understand what they can't see, we've got to give them tangible examples of businesses or companies uh, or, sorry, or government agencies that discover something that they didn't otherwise discover um, or know uh, through taking this different approach. Um, one of the other examples that we had um, very early on in the establishment of um, uh, the innovation lab um, that um, established in the industry department called BizLab was uh, we let them cut their teeth on a, a, on a corporate project which was, uh, and again, forgive me if I've told this story already, but it was, a, it was about travel approvals um, and, and um, the corporate area wanted to improve the processes for travel approvals because everyone kept complaining about it and there was a bad internal audit thing or something. Anyway, so instead of doing focus groups and asking people what they did and what they thought was wrong uh, or a survey, they went out and actually watched people watched what they did to try and understand what was going on. And they went to eight different areas and um, there was three sort of startling results. Um, the first was uh, 
they were all doing it differently. Not one of them was doing it the same way. This is the travel, you know, entering the travel in the system, getting the approvals done, who, what level needed to approve it, what needed to be approved, yada, yada, yada. Not one of them was doing it the same way. The second thing they discovered was that all of them, all eight or seven or whatever, were doing more than was needed according to the guidelines. In other words, they were imposing red tape on themselves because they were conservative and they wanted to make sure they were doing the right thing or whatever. And then the third thing was that when, they, when people were asked, where did you, why did you do it that way? They said, oh, well, ask the person next to me. And I did what they told me to do. Except for one person who went looking for the guidelines on the intranet and couldn't find them and then asked the person to get next to them. Uh, and so, I mean, at one level you kind of hear that and you think, oh, yeah, well, that sort of sounds about right. But these were things that wouldn't have been picked up any other way. So it's an example of you need a practical example of things to show people if you do it this way, this is what you might discover, that you won't discover any other way. Um, yeah. So I think, I think you, the bottom line with all of that is if you're wanting to try and convince people about the wisdom of this stuff, A, they've got to kind of experience it. Uh, and that can be partly by getting them to go out and do ethnographic user research themselves, <laughs> getting them to sit in on the interviews with people who are affected by the policy or programs or whatever that you're responsible for and, and actually getting a better appreciation of what really makes them tick, what else is going on in their day when they're affected by the thing that you're responsible for. Um, and secondly, um, show them examples, make it real for people and make it real in the sense of we thought this, but it turned out that. Um, bottom line is, most of what you learn by doing this sort of user research does confirm the things you know already. So it's very easy for people to say, well, we knew all of that. But it's normally there's this sort of 10 to 15 percent of kind of aha moments which lead people to go, hmm, but we didn't know that bit. Um, and that can often be the value added. Very interesting. We're also just experimenting with um, playing games. So um, Ole has purchased the Get Kanban board game for us and I think we're all going to have a go and see how badly we go at that um, to help us understand what the processes are and where we might fail. Yeah. So, yep. yeah, very interesting. Um, uh, thank you to the GA Talks moderator who has popped up the link to the anthropologist walks into a bar up there. Um, I, I have got a few more questions which I'm going to work through, but if anybody who's listening in has questions, please don't hesitate to put them up there because we're more than happy to take questions from the audience today too. I don't necessarily need to get through all of the questions I have here. Uh, but on to the next one. How do you influence change when everyone in the audience nods and agrees and then goes back to BAU? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes some extreme violence is required to make people know that you're serious. I'm only joking. I'm joking. Um, uh, so uh, it's a mixture, right? So you've got to show people that, um, that it's actually going to work. So one of the, one of the, I, I, so did I talk about the turtles last time? Anyone remember? Were you there, Tanya? Did I talk about turtles? I, I was there last time. I don't recall turtles. But... Okay. So. <laughs> One of the things that um, in the early stages of thinking about this in the Department of Industry that I worked through was people sort of came to me and said, look, you're not going to convince people and there's these different types of people and you've got to convince them all. And the first one was about a week after I arrived in industry, you know, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, full of all of, you know, crazy zealotry. Um, uh, one of the sort of wise old uh, folk uh, for, of, of the industry department came up and metaphorically put their arms around me, well, not their arms, they put their arm around my shoulder and they said, David, you've got to understand there's a lot of turtles around here. Uh, and, and I said, oh, really? What's a turtle? And they said, well, they see the tsunami of change on the horizon and they're swimming around in the shallows and the, and the wave comes closer and closer and closer and at the last minute the turtle pulls in its head 
and flippers and waits for the wave to go over. And the wave goes over and then gradually the water subsides and then they pop out their flippers in their head and they start swimming around in the shallows again. And, and of course, I can't, it's a very easy metaphor. Um, and I thought, right, well, I'll be there with a meat cleaver ready to snap all the flippers when they flip them out again. And then I thought, no, that's not very progressive. That's not the way we do things around here. Um, and, and of course, my big reflection was not their fault. It, you know, that turtle's perfectly adapted to its environment. It's had several tsunamis in its life and that's what happens, right? Uh, and so it made me think about ways in which, uh, A, you can appeal to the turtle in a way that um, means that they think, oh, this could be better. It's not something to be afraid of and wait out and then pop out again. Um, but equally that it might not be just an episode. There's something that's going to stick uh, and they might need to get used to the new environment. Then people said to me, oh, well, there's also this other group and they're the pragmatists. Uh, and 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 they um, they've seen it all before, uh, and um, and they're the engine room of the organisation. They're, they're often middle management. They're EL twos, band ones, uh, and if they can see that something's actually going to work and make their lives easier and deliver value, they'll be into it. Otherwise, they will just smile and nod and go off and do whatever they would always do. Um, and, you know, they're the kind of people who think, um, you know, all the people above them are, are don't understand or are unreasonable and all the people below them are idiots. Um, and and so, you know, they're the meat and the sandwich and, and why would they do anything funky, new or different unless it's actually going to work? But they are the engine room of the organisation and it's not their fault that they're pragmatists. They might be pragmatists and turtles. Um, but... They've, they've got a clear sense of what works and they're not going to be fiddling around with stuff that's um, just some newfangled thing. You know, they'll be saying, okay, you turkeys can go off and play with the fairies at the bottom of the garden. We'll, we'll continue to do the real work here. So you've got to show them that actually this thing is better. This thing is actually going to work. So you've got to demonstrate value. You've got to actually have tangible, practical examples of people who've worked in a different way and have achieved something really good and who, who are themselves saying, no, this thing works, who might have been turtles or pragmatists previously. And then the last group that people said to me, geez, you've got to get the stormtroopers on board. And I said, oh, well, who are the stormtroopers? And they said, well, the stormtroopers are kind of the people who always get thrown at whatever the emergency is. You know, they you know, take that building or take that hill or whatever. Uh, and they're, you know, they're often regarded as the bright young things and the people who are going to be the leaders, future leaders of the organisation and yada, yada, yada. And they're very, very, very attuned to what it is they need to do to get on around here. Um, and, and they want to do good work, but they're also very attuned to um, what, does, what, does, what will get me my, you know, advanced within the organisation. If you can get them on board with it, not only do you get the most important things that you've got to deliver done really well in a different way, but you're if influencing the future leaders of the organisation. I mean, mindful that a lot of stormtroopers, of course, aren't the future leaders of the organisation because they get killed in battle and they never go anywhere. Um, but some of them are. Uh, and it's quite important that it's shown that the future leaders of the organisation are also on board and working in different ways. And again, it's not just the aficionados uh, playing with the fairies at the bottom of the garden on stuff that no one cares about. Um, so those are these sort of three different groups, if you like. I'm sure you could think of any number of other metaphors for um, different groups. But a lot of it comes back to showing it can work um, and not just having one or two people being the champions, but having um, investing in having a broader number of people who are saying, no, this, this is good, we should give this a go. Not just senior people, senior people are important, but as, as you all know, often in any um, branch, let's say of you know, 30 people or whatever, um, some of the most influential people won't be um, the SS officer or even the section heads. It'll be people who are just 
have a quiet uh, leadership uh, and who are key influences uh, within a team. So getting them on board is pretty important um, and investing in winning the hearts and minds is pretty important with them. Mm. I feel like um, people carry a lot of scepticism with them these days. They've all seen the waves of different project management and um, and yeah. ways you meant to inter interact with your teams and how team leadership will work in different ways. And yeah. I feel like there's a lot of scepticism that comes with people's background thoughts and it's very hard to get over that hump to the trust position where they where as you say you show them value and that they can continue yeah. with that is that something you've experienced yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and and why wouldn't they <laughs> um so a lot of this is about having empathy um which is again part of human-centered design um with in the change process um and you know why would people put themselves through something some newfangled thing um, if they didn't think it was going to work uh, or they didn't have confidence uh, in it. So it's a very natural and understandable thing for people to do. Um, and so I never feel cross about it. Uh, if anything, I feel cross with myself when I don't pay enough attention to it. Um, uh, and and I, think it's, I think it's partly also about, like I said before, you need a sort of minimum viable vocabulary. There are some different concepts, and if you don't treat them as different concepts, you don't, you're not actually changing anything. Um, but you don't need very many of them to get some of those different ways of working. Um, and it is important that everyone uses the language the same way. Um, otherwise, it's just a mess. Um, and I've certainly seen that happen. Um, uh, and, and I think the other thing about that is you do need to invest a bit in getting, in lifting the skills. I, I talk about it as um, you need to invest in a bit of scaffolding because it's not just about sending people off to courses. In fact, it's not about sending people off to courses. It's actually more about what they learn by doing um, in the workplace. And that's why I say scaffolding because what you effectively need is... Um, some people who can show how to do it on things that you're actually working on and can be more like a coach. Um, that seems to me, in terms of what I've seen, is to, to be the thing that works. Um, and it's a little bit expensive, uh, but it's worth the investment because otherwise it's you're just lining people up and giving them a sheep, sheep drench uh, and thinking that's going to change their behaviour. And it's not. Um, it's got to be something that's a bit more sustained um, and and actually about doing something, not just learning about something. Um, like I said before, the experiential side of it is what sticks and people all of a sudden, after initially feeling both sceptical and irritated, um, then being a bit disorientated, all of a sudden go, oh, actually this is pretty good. Um, and look, the reality is, There'll be some people who, for whom this just simply won't matter, won't be their cup of tea. Uh, and they should be encouraged to seek excellence elsewhere. No, they, they, you, need, you need to think about having a sophisticated approach to change management. And you need to work out which of the things that you really want to pick up and do in your organisation or in a part of your organisation. But be mindful that you don't have to do everything. You don't have to follow things religiously, even though I talk about being a zealot. You do need to adapt it and apply it to the culture and the um, norms of the way in which you do things, albeit that some of those will be challenged by adopting these different approaches. So, for example, the culture around how projects are managed, um, how the hierarchy works, those things will be challenged and you need to be prepared for that. Um, but if it's done with a sense of humour, um, uh, in my experience, it generally goes okay. And ultimately, if you're really deeply committed to it and you think, no, this is actually really the way we're going to operate from now on in my team or in my division or whatever, um, and people really can't get with the program and you really feel deeply committed to it, well, you know, like I said, maybe they'll need to seek excellence elsewhere. Um, it's very important to me in my leadership team that I don't have anyone who's undermining it. 
So if there's anyone in my leadership team uh, who is deliberately being cynical, not, I don't mind scepticism. Scepticism's fine. Healthy thing to be scepticism. Healthy to question things. But cynical uh, and deliberately undermining, um, I just don't tolerate that. Uh, so, but I'll give everyone a chance in the leadership team to talk it all out first. So I mentioned before we had a half day. It was deliberately intended to be, tell, us, tell me how you're feeling. You know, what are you worried about? Um, how can we adapt this to be the right way? You know, what, are the, what are the cultural norms and things that we need to be mindful of? What do you think will work and not work? All of that's great. But once, then once everyone's signed up, um, you know, there has to be consequences if people then, as part of a leadership team, are deliberately undermining things. Yep, interesting concepts. Thank you. Um, Ole has posed a couple of questions. Um, yep. The first one is, thanks again, David, for sharing your insights. A principle of Agile is to not blame others, e.g. in retrospectives. How do we promote this in a climate where media and public debate is often centred on finding scapegoats to blame? We've seen a lot of this just recently. Um, this relates to the ability uh, to experiment, failing early and learning continuously. And I think that's something that we all struggle with. Um, and we know that there's a lot of blame culture out there at the moment. So how do you work around that blame culture? Mm. No, that's a really, really good point. Um, uh, it's an interesting one, isn't it? So um, I kind of have a sort of calculus for how to think about this, which is to say you get into trouble when you've invested a heap of money and time and, if you like, organisational credibility and worse still if it's the government's reputation, on something that's manifestly done when you finally reveal it. You don't lose much of anything if you've invested almost no money, no time, and very little organisational credibility or the government's reputation on something where you're just experimenting. So the way to de-risk these things is to say, we are experimenting. We're not spending loads of money. We're not taking loads of time. We're not polishing things within an inch of their lives before we share them. We're actually experimenting. Uh, and we're being humble about our ideas and we're testing them early and often. So to me, that's a way of de-risking and uh, making it much less likely that there's then a blame thing that happens. Now, at the end of the day, you can still have examples of either poor leadership uh, or the media being bastards or the politics of things running out of control. But if it's generally understood that, no, what we're doing is, is just testing some ideas and the minister, for example, is able to say, no, that's just my, that's my gang doing what they're meant to do. That's my peeps getting out and actually talking to people about stuff and trying things. And we have, they haven't invested much money. They're just, they're wanting to make sure that what if once we do start investing serious money, that it's the right stuff. And then as we do that investment, we're continually testing and making sure that we're actually learning and improving and delivering the right thing. Uh, I kind of believe that that's, a way to go. Um, and by and large, in my experience, once you explain that to ministers, they kind of go, yeah, fair enough. That's a good way of going. Um, it can be a little challenging for senior management or even middle management because people are nervous about the idea of showing something that hasn't been polished within an inch of its life. They're nervous about showing the early thoughts or the early work on something for fear that it might not be right. But that's kind of the thing you've got to get over, right? That's, the, that's part of the whole, it's actually at the core of the different cultural and mindset approach uh, is to get people comfortable with the idea that things will be shown in an unrefined state. Um, so, for example, uh, when we're 
experiment when I, over the years where I've been experimenting with getting teams set up to do this. I say, I say to them often, I want to I wanna come and see. I want you to do a showcase with me after two weeks. So you don't get six weeks or a month to write a paper and circulate it and get comments and then write another draft and whatever. Show me what you got in two weeks and do it in a slide deck, four slides, that's it. What have you learnt? What have you done? What are you going to do in the next two weeks? Uh, what, are you, what are you struggling with? What are your blockages? What do you need help with? Um, and again, if the senior people are involved early in that kind of relatively light touch kind of way, it's much harder for them to blame anyone because they've been involved all the way along. Whereas if you disappear off for six weeks and write a paper on something, much easier for a senior person to go, what are you clowns been doing for the last six weeks? This isn't what I asked for. Um, so I think that's another advantage of adopting this approach, showing what you're doing, don't tell what you're doing, um, and early and often and iterating. Yeah. Um, just a follow-up question for me on that. Do you think we run the risk of over-engagement and then disengagement from the community if we engage on everything um, as much as we'd like? Because we've got so much happening in government. If we engage on everything, I do wonder whether we'll just end up with a whole lot of people who are just sick of engagement. Do you think that's a, a concern or do you think that um, we've got a long way to go before then? Uh, so this is a really good, really good question. Um, and uh, the key thing here is when we talk about engagement, we're not talking, when you're talking about user research and you're talking about ethnography uh, and human-centred design, you're not engaging the same people. So you're not talking to the people who represent the people or the people who research the people. You're talking to the people. So you're not going to overload them because you don't go back to the same ones. There's lots of people. <laughs> um, uh, so what, what, what we definitely overload is talking to the stakeholder groups. And I'm not, so don't get me wrong here, I'm not suggesting you throw out engagement of peak bodies or representative groups or engaging of researchers. I'm not saying that. I'm saying complementary to that approach is to actually engage with the people. Uh, and so human-centred design is about actually engaging with users. And on almost everything we do, not everything, but almost everything, there's shitloads of them. You're not going to run out of people to engage with um, and you're not going to need to bother the same people more than once. Um, by and large, some of those people who are the people, they don't actually mind that much if you want to come back for a follow-up conversation. Because by and large, if you do this stuff properly, they'll feel as though it's the most wonderful experience of engaging with government they've ever had. Particularly, of course, if it actually leads to something useful happening, they get a little bit less excited if it doesn't go anywhere. Um, but by and large, the people don't get engaged in this way. No one goes out and watches and listens and learns humbly to understand what their day is like. Um, and very often, particularly for business people, for example, they're so excited to be able to show you the great things that they're doing um, and to tell you the things they hate about government. Um, but um, by and large, you're not, there, it's not, you're not there really at one level to get their feedback. You're there to observe and understand and build empathy uh, when you're doing that user research side of things. Um, and then when you're going out and testing it with testing ideas with real users, again, you kind of want to see them do the thing or engage with them on the thing rather than asking them to fill out a questionnaire. Um, and again, you can go to different people. You don't have to go to the same ones. So I think there's definitely a risk of overload around things like co-design with peak bodies. Because by and large, the peak bodies are, you know, five people in an office in Deakin. They're not, they don't have the firepower to be able to sustain um, 
co-design on lots and lots of things. Anyway, sorry, I'm rambling. I'll stop. No, no, it was a good point. Um, and I like your distinction between those stakeholders and um, our community more broadly, um, the peak bodies and the community more broadly. And I think that's a really good point. Um, Ole, I think, actually, I think we've come to the point where I've got probably a room for one more question. And Ole has posed a question here that I was wondering myself. So I'm going to ask this one. Um, what are your thoughts about humorously reducing hierarchies when budgets and numbers of staff are often seen as proxies for personnel worth in the APS? Uh, personal worth, sorry, in the APS. Sorry, was the question humorously? Uh, yes, I think Ole wants you to see whether you can do this humor humorously, but if you can't, I'm happy to take the non-humorous avenue. <laughs> um, so say the question again. So what are your thoughts about reducing hierarchies when budgets and numbers of staff are often seen as proxies for personal worth in the APS? So the more staff you have and the bigger budget you have, the more value people think you are, more valuable people think you are. So I suppose what I'd say about that is um, you could you could choose to start with actually reducing budgets and staffing and whatever and hierarchy and whatever. Uh, I'm not sure I'd start there. I think I'd start by saying how can you work within the existing structures in a different way um, and provide uh, more freedom and autonomy uh, within the existing structures uh, uh, for things to just happen faster um, and with more joy. <laughs> Um, rather than getting people losing the will to live. Um, so what do I mean by that? So, for example, in the way in which we're approaching things in my joint now, uh, we got a consulting firm to come in and just look at how we were doing stuff. And it was very clear that for an individual project, they ended up with um, up to five reporting lines. So how do you get rid of the stuff, not necessarily by changing the hierarchy, but just saying there will be only one reporting line. Um, they had multiple governance committees that they were reporting to. Um, get rid of them, have showcases and one mechanism for governance. Um, so in other words, be clear about are we informing people or is this a governance process? Um, yeah, so I guess I'd, I guess where I'd start is probably not by seeking to sort of blow the place up, uh, even humorously. Um, I, I guess I'd start by saying, can you work differently? And I, I, my view is it is possible to work differently without blowing the place up. And my suspicion then is it'll become more obvious which bits of the system are redundant uh, and may be able to then be um, removed uh, without creating huge risk. Um, but there's only, I'd come back to, there's only, meant, there's only so much risk you want to take on uh, in wanting to move to different ways of working. Um, it's very hard, right? It's not an easy thing to do. I, I'm certainly not suggesting we've got it all nailed. Um, and so there's a part of me that says, you know, uh, don't bite off more than you can chew. Hmm. Or bite off more than you can chew and chew like all buggery. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> uh, I think um, we've reached a point where we probably couldn't fit in another question. So I would like to That's thank fine. you very much, David, for um, joining us once again at GA. I got a lot of value out of that um, and I'm pretty sure that everybody else online will have. Um, and we're really looking forward to seeing your journey continue in the APS too and how you can keep changing digital culture in the APS because I think um, having great champions like you do make a really big difference to the rest of us having a vision and how we can implement that too. So yep. thank you and uh, thank have you. a great um, afternoon. We're all, we're all old dogs that can learn new tricks. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm still a work in progress. We all are. So. Mm. Excellent. Thank you very much, David. Okay. Thanks very much, everyone. See ya. Thank you. Bye.